Our lecture on some foundational articles from the philosophical literature on the ethics of abortion is brought to you from Keefe Offer Park here in lovely Madisonville, Tennessee. So first, An Almost Absolute Value in Human History by John T. Noonan. Noonan argues that abortions that are sought for reasons other than to save the life of the mother are what he calls selfish and cruel because they they would seem to neglect the value of the unborn developing human. Now, unborn developing human, or UDH, is not a term used by Noonan. In fact, it's not a term used by anyone but me, as far as I know. And it's intended to be a morally neutral term between the pro-choice slanted cold term fetus and the pro-life very warm term baby. And so uh, I've had students tell me in the past that Matt UDH is pretty cold. It's not, it's not very neutral because it's about as cold as fetus. But here I'm just attempting to find some in-between term because when we use language such as fetus, it seems to slant the conversation in a pro-choice direction, undermine the potential value of, of the, uh, the UDH. If you use baby, it seems to slant the conversation in a pro-life direction. And we need to have some neutral language to think through this with a clear head. But in any case, Noonan argues that abortions that would terminate the, uh, the UDH for reasons other than to save the life of the mother are selfish and cruel. And these are his terms because after conception, and that's, that's the important point, the important stage of development is conception. After conception, the UDH possesses the, the genetic code to become a full human being like the rest of us. And in fact, the terminology I'm using is a little bit misleading because Newton wants to say that once conception occurs, when the sperm hits the egg, the division occurs or begins to happen, the genetic code is determined, then this entity possesses that code, that blueprint, to become a full adult like the rest of us. And what's relevant about being able to become a full adult, or what's morally relevant about being able to become a full adult like the rest of us, is that we possess the power of autonomy. Like no other creature in the universe, we are able to reflect on our character, to reflect on our life trajectory, to make plans, and to self-author, to self-evolve, as Noonan says. And so this sets us apart from the rest of, of creation, or the rest of all creatures. Uh, it it uh, distinguishes, distinguishes us from anything and everything else and gives us high moral value. Now you might note and notice that this is consistent with Immanuel Kant's emphasis on rationality and the power of reason and autonomy and such. Noonan doesn't explicitly uh, draw on Kant, but notice that connection. So Noonan argues that once conception occurs, that entity, that UDH, has great moral value. Now, he concedes that perhaps it doesn't have quite as much value as one of us walking around, and that's because pregnancies aren't always successful. Sometimes miscarriages happen. Sometimes spontaneous abortions for, for unknown biological reasons occur. It's very sad when this happens, but Noonan's point is that since it's the case that the development of the UDH is a matter of probabilities, probability that it will become a full adult like the rest of us and possess that power of autonomy, which gives it that, that high moral status, that perhaps they have slightly less value, but they have a heck of a lot of, a value, of, of value um, and shouldn't be considered as uh, we might think about a clump of, of uh, skin cells or some hair or something. Uh, this is a, a potential person. And even when I say that, I should even say potential person. He would just go ahead and say that, that they're humans and that gives them that value because they have that capacity. Okay, so that's, that's Noonan. Uh, after conception, abortions are selfish and cruel, except in cases to save the mother's life. Judith Jarvis Thompson, on the other hand, in her classic article, and both of these are from the 70s, um, A Defense of Abortion, she offers some creative and very interesting, and in some cases illuminating, arguments by analogy to help us better understand how our own intuitions and considered convictions around the ethics of abortion. And so she imagines us, she asks us to imagine several different scenarios, very interesting scenarios. The first of which is that you wake up tomorrow morning and you're connected by a series of tubes and such to a famous violinist. And the Society for Music Lovers is standing around with their suits and their bow ties. And they say, don't be alarmed. This is a famous violinist that you're hooked up to. And he has a kidney condition. And he needs to remain hooked up to you for the next nine months to survive. You have a very rare blood type. And if he's not allowed to remain hooked up to you, then he will surely die. Well, Thompson says, well, if, if you were to wake up in this, this way, connected to this violinist, 
of course it would be okay to disconnect, um, even though, though it's the case he would die. And what this reveals is, is that even if we think that persons have a right to life, even if we all agree that that's the case, this right isn't absolute. It doesn't mean we have to do anything and everything to ensure that, that persons stay alive. She says at the outset of her article that, look, UDHs aren't persons. And this is a philosophical concept that is developed more, more richly um, as the, uh, the landscape and the literature and such evolved since these articles were originally written. But personhood, most philosophers would, would agree, entails several different capacities. And these capacities would begin with consciousness, the ability to feel pleasure and pain, the ability to engage in relationships, and the most fully developed capacity of personhood would be what Noonan emphasizes and Kant emphasizes, which would be rationality and autonomy, or the autonomy that it facilitates. So Thompson says at the outset that, look, UDHs are not persons, but let's grant for the sake of argument, for the sake of thinking through this, this right to life stuff, if, if we all agree that there is, people do have a right to life, or persons enjoy a right to life, let's assume for the sake of argument that UDHs are persons and see where the reasoning goes. And so she offers this violinist argument as an example to undermine the argument that since we all have a right to life, we have to do everything within our power to keep one another alive. She says, here's a clear case where you wouldn't have to stay connected to this violinist. And by the way, notice how this violinist situation mirrors pregnancies that are, are the result of rape. You presumably didn't do anything at all to risk becoming connected to a violinist before you went to bed last night. So if you wake up tomorrow and you are connected, uh, this is similar to having a pregnancy forced upon you through a, an interaction that was not chosen. And so if you think it would be okay to walk away from this violinist and allow them to die, then it would also be okay, Thompson argues, to give this argument by analogy, that it would be okay to have an abortion in, in the cases of rape. That, that's a case of rape. What about cases where the mother's life is endangered? And of course, this is something that Noonan go, goes ahead and says uh, an abortion would be tragic, but okay in this case. But uh, Thompson wants to argue against what she calls the extreme view. And the extreme view isn't held by too many people, but she wanted to shoot it down nonetheless because some people at the time did hold this position. And the extreme view is that abortion is never permissible, even in cases when it is needed to save the life of the mother. And the argument sometimes would go like this. It's never okay to kill an innocent person to save another person. If a woman's pregnant, the UDH is innocent. Therefore, it wouldn't be okay to kill the UDH to save the mother. If they're both of equal value, they're both persons, you can't intervene in that way and directly kill an innocent to save another. And so she wants to shoot down that argument, and she does it with the expanding baby analogy. She says, imagine that you're inside a tiny house. I don't think they had tiny houses back in the 70s, but if you ever see any of those tiny house shows on Home and Garden and the other channels my wife loves to watch, these itty bitty houses. So you're inside one of these, these tiny houses with just a very small kitchen and, and dining room and one bedroom and whatever. They're like 400 square feet. And you're in there with an expanding baby. Imagine a, uh, a baby that's blowing up like a balloon. So of course this is not actually going to happen, but imagine there's this expanding baby. It's expanding like one of the, the Macy's Day Thanksgiving uh, or May, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade uh, balloons. Uh, and say, if, if you don't take a needle and pop this expanding baby, it's going to crush you and kill you. And so she asked the question, would you be morally justified in intervening and popping this, this balloon baby and preventing it from killing you? And she says, yeah, of course you would. It would be a clear-cut case of self-defense. You needed to intervene in this way. You needed to, to kill this expanding baby to preserve your own life. And therefore, the extreme view doesn't make very much sense. It doesn't hold a whole lot of, whole lot of weight. There's a, a football game going on over here, by the way. It gets Madisonville versus Sweetwater. So that undermines the extreme view, which, of course, Noonan doesn't endorse, but some people did. She also asks us to consider a few other interesting examples, um, one of which is the people seeds people seeds argument and the people seeds argument is that imagine that people seeds float around in the air just like pollen and if you happen to leave one of your windows open one of these people seeds could float through the window and land in your carpet and begin to grow she says 
if a people seed were to float through your window and plant itself in your carpet, uh, maybe you would have an obligation to allow it to grow there, to water it, to nurture it, etc. But you didn't invite it in. She says, consider further the case in which you put screens on your windows and screens on your doors to prevent the people seeds from, from coming into your, into your living room. And if you take all these precautions and you put up some fancy screens and I don't know, you, you, pray some, you uh, spray some people seed repellent on the carpet or something, and one of them comes in and it plants in your carpet nonetheless, the fact that you had taken these proactive steps to prevent the implantation would somewhat absolve you from any responsibility to nurture the people seed. Well, she says, if you agree with this line of reasoning, this is analogous to cases in which couples take pre preventative measures to prevent becoming pregnant. If they use birth control or condoms or other methods to prevent a pregnancy, but become pregnant nonetheless, then they have less of an obligation to maintain that pregnancy than they would were they to be more reckless. Now, maybe I'm putting some words in Thompson's mouth. She doesn't go as far as to say that you would have an obligation to maintain a pregnancy if you engage in voluntary non-protective sex and such. That seems to be an implication of her argument. Last, Thompson distinguishes between just actions. Hey, good morning. How are you? Distinguishes between just actions and, or actions that are unjust and actions that are indecent. And she wants to say that the former are much more, they generate much more powerful moral obligations and the latter don't entail such powerful moral obligations. She wants to say that if it were the case that the violinist scenario was changed such that you didn't have to remain connected to him for nine months, but only for one hour, she wants to argue the violinist would have no legitimate strong claim against you to force you, to morally force you to remain connected. You didn't do anything to fall into the situation, even though it would just take an hour, you're not required to do this as a matter of justice. And so she wants to argue that, however, if you were to refuse to allow the violinist to remain connected just for this one hour, this would be indecent. You would be susceptible to legitimate criticism, but nonetheless, the violinist would have no legitimate claim against you to, to remain connected, and therefore it's not unjust. She also offers the example of she herself being very ill and having this terrible fever. And the only thing that will, will save Thompson from this fever and this illness is for Henry Fonda to get on a plane. And then this was written a long time ago. Imagine Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt has to get on a plane and fly to where she is and lay his hand on her fevered brow. And if he does this, she'll fully recover, survive, no big deal. Well, she wants to argue that you have no claim against Henry Fonda to have to get on a plane and fly and come and do this to save your life. Therefore, this right to life language, it does not entail this absolute obligation to do anything and everything to save any person's life. And of course, she wants to relate, relate this back to uh, potential protections for UDHs. But in this case, she even wants to argue that if Henry Fonda were even in the same room with you, he would have no you would have no claim against him, no, no absolute or very powerful or strong justice-based claim for Henry Fonda to come across the room and lay his hand on your, brow, or your fevered brow. And she says that um, it, would, it would not be unjust for him to refuse to do so, but it would be indecent because it would be such a minor inconvenience. And so just some complexity there to, to help clarify the argument that Thompson is making. There's a whole lot more to this abortion issue, but these two articles are a wonderful way to begin the discussion. I hope you've enjoyed the concepts and look forward to exploring them and others with you.